friends and welcome back to the channel. I'm really excited about today's video because we are doing a collaboration with Christy from A Fostered Life over here on YouTube. And she has another video that's going to be going up on her channel if you want to talk um, or learn a little bit more about being a public foster parent. We talked a little bit about that. But today we're going to be talking about a couple things, but really building community and maybe some of the connections and similarities that foster parents in general have. Um, so let's just get into today's video and I'm going to introduce Christy or let her introduce herself. And Christy, if you just wanna let us know a little bit about why you got into fostering, how long you've been fostering and yeah. maybe why you share it. Sure, sure. Thank you so much for um, wanting to do this, Kate. I am so excited to be in real time with you and um, putting our channels together. I love connecting with another foster parent who I think approaches it a lot the same way I do. So um, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I my my involvement in foster care really goes back to when I was about 30. The summer I turned 30, I happened to also be working. I was working in Manhattan and I had a fairly long commute from where I lived in Staten Island. And so I often would read the newspaper on my commute. And um, there was an article in the paper, several actually, but um, highlighting a particular story, which is now, um, it's a fairly well-known story. You can look it up on Wikipedia or something, but it's the Collingswood boys. And it's a, a, um, a sibling set of brothers who were in foster care for a long time and then ultimately were adopted into a family. But um, this family that had fostered them for a, lot, a long time and then ultimately adopted them just really abused them pretty, pretty horrifically. And um, at the time I saw the article, the um, the trial for the couple was starting. And so there had already been a lot of research done about these boys and what they had been through. And at the time I was 30 and I was not married and I had actually gone through a breakup. Um, and I just sort of thought I was gonna be single for a really long time, which I was, I was single until I was 36, um, which some people would say isn't a long time, but when you're 30, that yeah. seems like a long time. Yeah. And um, But I was really happy as a single adult and I had a great community of friends, most of whom were moms. And I had um, a great church community. I had a really good job. I was making a good income. I had a two bedroom apartment. And I thought, my word, there is no reason for me not to become a foster parent. I have this bedroom. I, you know, if I had a school aged child, it would work with my work schedule. I talked with my boss. I talked with my friends at church. I knew I had support and like they would, they would support that decision. And so I started the process in New York when I was 30 as a single woman. And um, a long story that I will skip over right now, but it, the, the door to that closed at that time. And, and the main thing was that I ended up accepting a different job and that job had me traveling a lot. And so I knew if I take this job, either I'm going to have to put my foster parent um, goals on, you know, on hold. Mm -hmm. But the and so I did take the job. The desire, however, never went away. And like this sense of, um, really like a burning passion. I had more of a passion to want to do that than I ever had to want to have a child uh, biologically or anything. And so um, when I met the man who is now my husband and we started dating, um, we had some early conversations about the big things because he was 40, I was 35 when we met and neither of us wanted to waste any time with mm -hmm. each other. He also lived in Seattle. I lived in New York. So we were like, let's just cut to the chase. <laughs> <laughs> and um and so we talked about family and I said to him you know I actually um I don't really want to have biological children I would very much like to be a foster parent and and that might mean that I that we have a lot of kids who come and go it could mean that we adopt but you know, my vision is to really be a foster parent in the truest sense of the word. Yeah. And he, his first words were, I love it. And, yeah. and from that moment forth, we knew we were on the same page and we have been on the same page the whole time. So um, we got married when I was 36 and he was 41. And um, we got licensed two years later and we had our first children placed with us um, two weeks after we got our license. And I dove into that um, you know, both new mom and new foster mom. We had two children at the same time, an infant and a, and a elementary school aged child. And, um, and it was at that time that I realized how much I needed other people who understood what I was going through because my mom friends were wonderful. We had a lot of cheerleaders, but we had nobody 
who understood what was coming at us every day. Um, and so I started looking online to try to find like, who can I talk to about this and didn't find anything. All I found on YouTube was either like those videos of like foster youth who've been adopted and are talking about how wonderful the agency that adopt got them adopted yeah. is. Yeah. Um, and so, and I was like, yeah, it doesn't seem like yeah. it's the whole story, you know? And then, or I would hear from foster youth who have been in horrific experiences and are using YouTube as a platform to let their voices be heard. And I was like, that is something I need to hear also. But that's not, you know, what I'm looking for in the sense of I need to know what am I doing here. And so six months in, um, I had then been with a good therapist, a trauma therapist, and I had also had a parenting coach that the state provided for us because we were deemed a family in crisis about two months after we had our kids placed with us mm -hmm. um, because they really wanted to help us keep our children, mm -hmm. um, but we had some things we just needed professional help with. And so we had a woman who came in and taught me how to be a trauma-informed positive parent. Um, and I realized none of this is intuitive to me. None of this is what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. None of this is parenting the way I saw it done. And so that's when I was like, you know, I think I'm gonna start a YouTube channel and just start putting these ideas, you know, putting this out there. Like one of my earliest videos was, how old is your foster child? Because I was like, you cannot expect your child who's been through all this stuff to act like a typical Absolutely. seven year old, or you might have a seven year old who's only been out of diapers for a year. I mean, you know, that's a situation that we know of, you know, and, yeah. and so like, um, I started the channel really recognizing I still have so much to learn. I mean, I had only been doing it for six months. That was pretty cheeky of me to start eating <laughs> all that foster you know, when I was only doing it for six months, but I was like, you know, there's just stuff I'm learning that I really wish I had known before we had the children placed with us. So, um, and we've had, you know, I never give numbers of how many kids we've had, but um, I will say we've had over 15 um, okay. and who have come and gone and, um, and we're still in touch with all but one of them. Oh, wow. That's so amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And do you foster all ages? Right uh, so that's really interesting. Yeah. So when we first started, we were zero to five. And then as our son grew older and we, you know, we hadn't adopted him, um, we increased our license. Then um, I mentioned to you in our last call that we, I get the list every single day of yeah. kids who need placement. And so they, in fact, um, somebody called us about a boy they had sent out a notice about and um they were desperate they said he's he's been bouncing every night he's been in a different place oh. is there any way that you could just keep him until this particular trial was happening because they weren't going to place him in foster long-term care okay it's you know yeah he it was in that in between time so we said sure bring him over we've got a bed and they brought him over well he was outside of our license and um we didn't know that it was a big deal but yeah. apparently it was and so okay when our licensor found out that we had had a child who was older than we're licensed for, she didn't write us up, but she just said, you can't do that. You know, you can't do that. And I was like, well, they, your people brought them to us. I mean, who, you know, who's responsible here? They called me and said, can you take him? And we're like, no, you know, yeah, you yeah. can't have him because he's 11 and we're only licensed through 10, you know? So, um, that was a good lesson. So we ended up increasing our license and basically we've always kept our license, um, around our oldest child's age or a little bit older. Okay. But then um, we got this call in um, February. Um, we had had a little guy with us for most of the previous year. He left um, in December, right the day before Christmas, two days before Christmas. And um, we were gonna take a long break. We said, we're on break, don't call us, you know, and <laughs> we're gonna just reestablish our family as a family of five and, um, Six weeks later, that child's caseworker called me and she said, I know you're on a break. <laughs> <laughs> I love that they still call, right? <laughs> I know. Anyway, um, so she so she said, I have this wonderful teenager. And um, she said, she's just amazing. She's so sweet. She's, you know, and for through no fault of her own, she's had to move a bunch of times. And we're just looking for like one place she can stay until this certain date. And um, 
And so we said, sure. But at that time, I said, you know, we have to make sure we get permission from our licensor. So we went ahead and got licensed to 18. So we're, we're licensed now for two children ages zero to 18. And we have had, you know, um, we have our own three kids and then we have had two more. So um, at any given time, we have four or five children. Okay. So full house. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, well, I just want to say thank you because you are one of the first channels that, uh, one of the only channels really, I think there was Bubble Lush, but she had, was done talking about it then. I think yes. she shared a little bit. Yes. Um, but yeah, so I was like, every single video you put out, I was okay. trying to <laughs> learn everything I could. And I think just building that community, I know you have a Facebook mm -hmm. community and you have your flourishing foster parent community as well, which mm -hmm. is something newer that maybe I'll get mm -hmm. you to share about in a bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for me, it's just building community. And, you know, my, well, my agency used to put on support groups, but because of funding, they've actually been cut. We, we no longer have oh like, our own workers at all anymore. Wow. So we're kind of teamed up with ch the children's worker, kind of gets the foster mm. parent too, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is has been a newer thing, but tricky to navigate. Um, yeah. And we have no foster parent support groups at all. And those were life-giving to me, being able yes. to go once a month. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, I consider my, myself to be a pretty strong emotional person I can keep it together for the most yeah. part but some things that have happened in our journey have just yeah. done right. me yeah. and just Maybe. needed someone to cry with that, no, no, that understood true. and you know the beautiful thing about being online is that you can create this this sort of community mm -hmm. anywhere so maybe tell me a little bit about your flourishing life foster parent. oh sure yeah thanks for asking about that yeah um so my channel's you know been on for five years and um and I, like you, because you mentioned this before, I get a lot of email from people and I do my best to answer it, comments and that sort of thing. I've really tried to respond to everybody, but it got to where I couldn't. And I realized that there is something a little strange and frankly vulnerable about um, being on this end of it, putting out all this content and then having no idea who's watching mm -hmm. and who's engaging. And I realized there's stuff I would like to share um, that I think would be really, really helpful that I will not do where I have no idea who's watching this, how it's being used. You know, um, I, we could do a whole other thing on foster parent hate groups and stuff. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you've been targeted by them, but I sure haven't. Um, you know, and, and just, you know, like, trying to navigate that space of like being public, being vulnerable for the sake of the audience you're trying to reach yeah. while also, you know, recognizing that you have to be, um, you just have to be wise and protect your own kids and your own family and your own privacy and all that. So I wanted a way to engage where it would be like the best of ongoing training mm -hmm. and the best of a support group mm -hmm. and online so that you don't have to get a babysitter, yeah. you know, you can put a movie on or something and s escape in, a, in an informal way where we're on exactly like you and I are right now. We yeah. do it on Google Meet. And so each time, um, and so what it is morphed into and what it is currently is um, people join on Patreon and um, for $5 a month, they have access to these live calls mm -hmm. and um, a recording library of all the calls that we've done almost all the calls um and it's just like an effort to offer ongoing training insight education information encouragement um that people can listen to almost like a podcast in fact i think i'm going to turn it into a podcast i think that's going to be the next step because i'm really fumbling my way through this i'm sort of doing it a little bit at a time and going oh, okay that didn't work so well yeah. um but anyway, and so it's been wonderful. And so I've connected with, um, there are currently about 22 people who are in it. Um, most of them do not join the live calls. They listen later, but they email and say, you know, I was at work or I couldn't join you, but I really appreciated it. But, um, and then we also have a Q&A time. So I, I will sometimes bring on somebody else to be kind of the person talking about a topic or um, I will share, um, Right now we're going through a book called Beyond Consequences, Love and Logic. And it's a wonderful book on essentially parenting children with extremely difficult behaviors mm -hmm. um, because of trauma. And so it's kind of like a, it, it incorporates some of the content you would find in um, um, 
The Body Keeps the Score, mm-hmm. which is a wonderful book about trauma. Yeah. Um, and then also it, it's kind of like where parenting with love and logic doesn't work for kids with trauma backgrounds. Where, I mean, there are certain things from it that I think are great, but it, it by itself, it's not the model that's going to no. work. No. I'm a big fan of positive parenting solutions. I think of all of the parenting programs that I've seen, that's the one that most easily goes, you know, works with, um, with trauma informed parenting. Um, but this book is a great sort of, okay, you know, consequences, that's not going to work. I mean, you can consequence your kid all you want, but if what they're doing is because of trauma, all that's going to do is just exacerbate it and er, exasperate it. Mm -hmm. And that took me a while to realize. Um, But then logic, that whole parenting with love and logic, again, that works when you have a child who's coming from a a solid emotional base. But when you don't, um, certain aspects of it can actually contribute more trauma. Exactly. Um, and then, um, you know, control, like anyway, so we're going through that book together and it's been great and it's been a great, you know, tool. I just really want to equip people, resource people. And I feel like, um, my experience with this is that I need it as much today as I needed it five years ago. Like I need to refresh my own tool and like sharpen my own tools as much today because, you know, my kids are older and the challenges, while there has been tremendous growth, tremendous growth, each um, developmental stage, you you get a new wave of the child coming back into processing their story and their trauma and they process it in a different way with each developmental um, level. And so I'm like, okay, back to the books again. Like, what do we do now? You know? (laughs) So yeah. It's not, you know, with just the age and all of the things that come with that, let alone the trauma that stems and then, you know, what age you're actually dealing with. I think that's a really great book. I haven't read that yet. I saw you comment um, uh, to one of my friends, actually, she's a girl from my church that you had commented on that Facebook post. And, you know, she's coming to me a ton, but I've only had kids four and under, right? So the behaviors I'm dealing with are much different than Yes. They are a little bit older. And yeah. I'm, I don't know. And I was like, go see Christy. Go <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's so funny because I don't see all of the, you know, I just, I'm not on Facebook that much. It's funny because we, on the video that's going to be a chance, we talked about um, public foster parenting. And one of the things I've done recently is removed my personal Facebook profile. Yeah. So I still have a fostered life on Facebook, um, but I have removed my personal profile. So I'm not sitting on Facebook that much yeah. anymore. But um, when I do log on, I see the post from your group. And I just happened to be on when I saw that. And I was like, oh, I can so relate to this. And I just want to give another perspective. You know? Oh, that was so helpful to her. And she's reading that book. And <laughs> she's got, obviously, I'm not going to get into it, yeah, but a lot of things yeah. going on with her little one. So yeah, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah just the, any way, like getting back to the support, any way that mm-hmm. you can gain support from another foster parent, like, Things that you just think are never going to happen to you in your family situation when they do, it's, it's just so helpful to know that somebody else has gone through peeing through the vents or whatever it might be. Um, While we're talking about that, let's, and the positive parenting for myself, Mm -hmm. I know Mm -hmm. before I became a foster parent, I had a certain way I was going to parent and I don't think attachment or positive parenting was my, I thought, you know, that's uh kind of spoiling the child. Yeah. And yeah. I know that's a very popular mindset with people outside of the foster care world. So mm-hmm. maybe talk a little bit about yeah. how other people maybe view your parenting styles when you're using oh, positive sure. parenting techniques and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny because I've been on such a journey. I've I've really, um, my husband and I were very traditional in our views early on. We you know, we were going to be strict and our kids were not going to talk to us the way that kids and other <laughs> families talk. And, you know, and um, I know a lot of, you know, people have views like that. And then, you know, and then the Lord's like, oh, apparently you need to be humbled. So <laughs> I got this my thing. <laughs> um, so um, when we first started this, we had a child who um, had very extreme behaviors. So we were going to be those parents who were, you know, who were really like, I don't know, just we had traditional views and certainly um, consequences would have been our go to, you know, or or threats. Um, And uh, and so we had this little guy and um, 
he was doing all sorts of things. And I remember the first time that I told him that he was going to take, we used to be like, oh, we're not doing time out, yeah. you know? And then I'm like, you know, but obviously you can't, I mean, we weren't like looking to spank the child, but I'm just yeah. saying like, you know, we were like, he's gonna respect us and he's gonna listen to us. And no, that wasn't no. the case at all. And the level of his, um, his extreme behaviors, he was totally running the show. And, um, you know, I would say you're going to time out and he would like start flipping furniture over and take toys away if he was being, you know, doing things with them he shouldn't. I mean, it was just like, it was chaos in our house, honestly. Yeah. So I think one of the first, we, we were helped by Parenting with Love and Logic. I think that was a good book for us to read. Somebody sent it to me when we were first doing this and mm -hmm. it was one of the first parenting books that I read. And I do, I do think certain aspects of it were helpful, but they advocate things like, um, if I'm not mistaken, like, you know, I remember a story in the book about the guy like driving away and leaving his kids somewhere because the kids wouldn't come to the car. Yeah. And yeah, you never want to do that to yeah. a child who's got trauma or abandonment or whatever. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I am at a point now with my kids where I will say to them, I've asked you to come to the car I'm going to count to five and then I'm going to walk to the car and I hope you'll come with me. Mm -hmm. You know, And then I do it. I'm calm. I'm not threatening them, but I'm just letting them know it's time to go. And when you've got five kids, you can't have one who's constantly, I just took five kids to a museum today. Mm -hmm. So I mean, this, this happened to me just a little while ago. And getting back to that question, when I, about three years, three and a half years in, I was my worst self. I will say like this brought out the very worst in me too. It's, I think that foster parenting has brought out in many ways some of the best things in me, but I think it has also brought out the worst in me. I agree um, with you 100%. <laughs> yeah. and, and so I found myself, um, uh, I was in the red a lot. Um, I was not doing anything that was self-care at all. Mm -hmm. My husband and I were in marriage counseling nine months, 10 months into foster parenting because of a particular incident that happened with our one of our kids that resulted in us being under a CPS investigation. And mm -hmm. it was just a nightmare that first year. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we lost friends over it. It was just like awful. Mm -hmm. It was awful. And, um, and when um, we ended up in marriage counseling and the guy said, you know, you need to have some self-care type things. We were talking about that. And so my husband got me for Christmas that year. All, he got me tons of bubble bath, like all this bubble bath. Aww. Four years later, I still have it all. <laughs> <laughs> but what I realized is that I needed other things. And so like for me, bubble baths weren't the thing. Yeah. But um, I got into doing yoga, doing things like lighting incense and just meditating in the morning, and, you know. And I also... Um, I had started relying more heavily on the wine at the end of the night. And so I decided to stop drinking altogether just to mm -hmm. kind of take that out of my life as something that was a potential way to cope that was just not helpful at all. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so I made some of those big changes and then I signed up like, so, <laughs> so I ended up homeschooling one of my kids for a year, it was a school year because School just didn't know what to do with him. And he had wonderful special ed teachers, but he just did not fit anywhere. He was very bright, tremendous behaviors. And what they were doing is lumping him in with other kids with behaviors. And so he was just, he was surrounded by kids who were in chaos all the time. Yeah. And what he needed was good modeling and that sort of thing. And so I just said, you know, I, and I talked with his teacher and we decided I'm going to homeschool him for a year. Well, at the end of that year, um, the kids and I went to visit my parents and it was like my first real break in a very long time. And while I was there, I was like, I'm going to sign up for a marathon. <laughs> In my pajamas one morning, not having run in years, <laughs> at all, I registered for the Seattle half marathon, which is still like 13 some miles. And, you know, and that, but that was a good step in me, like signing up for something that became for me to, to do something for myself that got me out of, you know, my little world. And, um, and that was the first in a step toward you know, like that. And then I was really getting more into going to yoga regularly and just making these life changes that um, put me in a healthier place. Mm -hmm. And I think back to the 
one of the other things I did at that time was I registered for Positive Parenting Solutions. Mm -hmm. And I'd seen it on Facebook for like a year and it was like, get, you, you know, stop yelling at your child. I'll, yeah. I promise you, I'll help you do that. And I was like, you don't know my child. <laughs> It's like, uh, you only know. <laughs> yeah, I've been in touch. Amy McCready, the founder of that, she and I have been in touch because we've talked about doing something where I might come on and talk about foster parenting and positive parenting solutions. Yeah. It hasn't happened yet. But, um, but I think the reason I like that so much, because I also, through the first three years or so, I also started studying a lot on trauma. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it all came together. Um, the body keeps the score um attaching an adoption the connected child going to the refresh conference i've been for years and i saw i think you went this yeah, past year yeah. so taking workshops on trauma and going oh so like all of those times that we threatened him and did the behavior charts and all of these other things you know we're like if you do this again we're gonna no tv for a week or whatever he actually wasn't capable he didn't have the inner compass to be able to self-regulate himself. Yeah. yeah. And so once that clicked for me and I realized stuff happened in his brain, like this is not, this is not him being a naughty kid. This is not him being manipulative. This mm -hmm. is not him being rebellious. It's him with this whole background and his brain wiring in a different way. And we need to address that. And so what I love about positive parenting solutions that it, it's really rooted in two goals. And one of them is to empower children. Mm -hmm. her, her, one of her philosophies is um, that every child is even as young as two, they need to have a sense of empowerment and agency um, that they have some control of their world. And so offering what she calls a decision rich environment can make a huge difference. And so I thought about that through the lens of a child who has had no choice in yes. all of the things going on in their life. And, um, you know, I did a video on this, so I'm not getting into it right now, but that was a big one. And then um, the other connect, the other component of that is connection between mm -hmm. the parent and child. And she, she really hammers 15 minutes a day of undivided attention between one parent and one child twice a day. Mm -hmm. That's her number one tool for this, this parenting thing. And then she's got a bunch of other ones that are excellent. But um, how people have responded, well, um, I've had two big reactions. And one is from people who have not known us very long mm -hmm. and um, who parent traditionally and who um, feel like we're letting our kids get away with stuff and walk all over us or, you know, like get away with stuff. Yeah. And, um, uh, and, and to that, the positive parenting stuff would, would say that, that those parents are coming from a place of being driven by their ego. She talks a lot about how our ego drives us as parents. And I totally believe that because I would take it so personally when a child of five or six or 10 would undermine me, you know, mm -hmm. I would take it real personally. And I realized through this parenting thing that my ego was driving that. I would get so offended. But if I could stop taking it personally and step out of it and not be motivated by my ego, I wouldn't be so offended if a child got away, seemed to get away with something. If what, what I was really doing was allowing them to feel a sense of empowerment, mm -hmm. but still ultimately getting an outcome that I wanted. Mm -hmm. So the way I parent now is most of the time I give two or three choices, all of which I'm fine with. And I let the kid have the little hit of power by making that choice. Mm -hmm. um, and it might be like, do you want to leave in three minutes or five minutes? Yeah. And they're like, five minutes. And I'm yeah. like, okay, if you want five minutes, I guess we'll do five minutes. You know, yeah. <laughs> we're leaving. I mean, my goal was to leave in five minutes, yeah. you know? And so anyway, I could go on and on about that. But the other way that people respond is these are the folks who have known our family for five years. And they say, especially people who haven't seen it, like I, we go back to visit my family on the East coast a couple times a year. And they're like, wow, yeah, your kids have come so far. Yeah. And I'm like, they have, we all have, we've all come so far. I've come so far. 
I ha you know, I have done a lot of work on myself. So, well, I think it's so important. I love that you touch touch so much on self care, and I joke that I've gained the most baby weight being a foster parent. <laughs> <laughs> my biological children, yes. and you know, I go through periods of I'm being really good with my self care, and then right. I kind of let it fall again. So, I mm -hmm. think it's so important that you touch on that because I got to a point we had an investigation against us and I had a complete breakdown over it because yep. I was still working outside of the home at that point and not getting enough hours. I had a medically fragile infant and a toddler and like, you have to document every bruise. And I, oh. I did, and I had a mental breakdown and I've never experienced and nor do I ever want to experience that again. Yep. And I had a lot of my family questioning me, like, why are you doing this to yourself? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think there's very good intentions in our, or base training to become a foster parent to try and teach you about trauma informed parenting. Mm -hmm. But for one, it's people that haven't, yes, they see it in small doses, but they haven't parented it themselves. Right. Um, I find, you right. know, they're getting the information to relay to you, but it's not like they've lived it. Right. Um, so right. I just find that connection like, yeah, I learned about it, but it kind of was like in one ear out the other. Yes. And then I primarily had infants and toddlers. So yeah, sure. I had some hard toddler behaviors, but for the most part, I wasn't dealing with a lot of, and then my oldest placement ever, we had them for six months and yeah, it was like, my eyes were opened. Okay. Yeah. And that's when I just really started to dive in because I was like, there's no way. And yeah. I re remember one day he screamed at me, you're an idiot. And I was just yeah. like, <laughs> personal. I was like, you're, you're too little to even like, yes. no. and it just broke me. But it, yes. it was really good for me in the sense that no, I don't need to take this personally. The way his brain is, mm -hmm. you know, trying to handle everything, yeah. it's just, it's different. And as and you're, not getting parent, kids with like, you're not getting kids whose raw material is the same as like a child you've had that you gave birth to, exactly. or, yeah. you know, um, or I shouldn't say raw material, but like what they've, they're already a formed individual before they come to you. And they've mm -hmm. been formed by things like they've probably heard somebody call somebody else an idiot. And they're, you know, that's what they do when they're angry, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. I just think it's so, so important that you read all of those books. Everyone you mentioned, mm -hmm. just to keep, you know, anything TBRI with Karen mm -hmm. like Purvis. Mm -hmm. I think all of her stuff is just amazing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of videos even on her channel that yeah. are the, <clears throat> Um, channel that she has. Yes. Um, I just, I think you have to live it a little bit in order for it to really connect. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Because I read some of those things beforehand and I was just like, whatever. <laughs> the That's first time I read it. Uh, we're gonna love them. We're yeah. gonna just gonna love them, and we're gonna love them so much. It's gonna change everything. Yeah, love yeah. can do it all, right? Yeah. Yes, all it takes is some love. And not I the remember. Therapy, not the therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I remember reading the Connected Child the first time, and I was almost like not bored, but I was just like, okay, yeah, yeah. And then I read it again after mm -hmm. we had that one little guy, and I was like, okay, I'm seeing mm -hmm. this now, and I just. When you start seeing the changes, like you said, some of your family has noticed how far your family has come. Yes. You know, when you start to implement some of these things and you see the drastic changes that happen, you know, from day first week in your care to however long they end up being with you. It is just incredible how how healing when you apply yeah. these parenting principles, like how truly healing it can be and how you know, just trying to be a good parent and love just isn't enough as a foster parent. So yeah. I, I try to really drive that point across on this channel here because yes. it's just, it's, it's vital in order yeah. to be a good yeah. foster parent, yeah. it's vital. And I just don't think it's portrayed that, you know, early on in your training, it's not portrayed how vital that information is. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and also I think it's, it bears mentioning, and I know you've, you've alluded to this a lot in your channel that we're not talking about healing um, there are certain wounds that no. we're not going to be able to heal. So we're not suggesting that doing these things is going to somehow make it as if this child never went through what they went through. Exactly. We're not going to be able to do that. And I think it really kind of, um, I've really revisited sort of wanting or, you know, um, reimagined instead of like wanting to help kids get to the point where it's like this never happened to them to actually help them to feel empowered to use their story in mm -hmm. a way that is, you know, in, empowering for them and makes them feel like it, they have more to offer the world because of what the story they've lived and to really, but, but it does, 
I think what we do see, and I'm sure you've seen this too, is um, how just providing predictability and, and structure helps kids feel so safe that the, the best parts of their self are like they don't, they can stop or they can um, reduce the amount of effort they have to put towards surviving and they can actually begin to let their personalities and their interests and who they really are, their, their best selves come out. And that that I find that happens when they really get into like the structure and the stability, predictability of it all. And, um, and also just the, um, the, um, like we, we have kids who they love the fact that we sit down to dinner every night, you know, just like living a, a way that's maybe different, um, maybe different from what they came from and, um, predictable. I just, I think that we can't undermine how much that, that helps kids. No predictability. I, that's the biggest thing I've seen with kids, you know, okay, we're leaving right now causes a huge meltdown too. Oh okay, we're leaving in 10, we're leaving in five, yeah. we're leaving in yeah. three, we're leaving in two. And it's yeah. an easy transition yeah. and just little things like that. And yes, we're not going to be able to completely heal them, but just to help them cope and deal with their window, you know, their regulation, just being able to regulate their feelings a little bit yes. easier and help yep. to control the emotions. Yeah. It's, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, I think we've been going on a lot. We were going to talk about <laughs> other things, but I think this video might be long enough. Um, let's just touch on two quick things and then we'll yeah. finish. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the Enneagram. So I'm yeah. Kevin. I would love to know what you are. Oh yeah. I wondered what you are. I'm a one. With okay. A two mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And you know, what, part of my Okay, so part of my self care was that I um, also started me with a spiritual a, a spiritual director mm -hmm. um, two years ago, and um, and she was the one who introduced me to the Enneagram. And at first, um, I wasn't ready to do the hard work of really getting honest and real with myself. Yeah. That so I had known a bit about it for a while, and then I would say about a year ago is when I really like began to dive in and the book that um she had recommended re recommended richard Rohr's book um on the enneagram but the book that i've really found super helpful is um is called the way back to you or the road back yeah, to you yeah and um and i think one of the things that it's beneficial to do in terms of the enneagram is um because i was saying to you like this whole experience brought out my worst self mm -hmm. and what I realized through both, you know, dealing with my health self care type stuff and really just trying to be healthy, but also reading about myself in the Enneagram yeah. is that um, I was able to, I'm able to now recognize when I'm being the worst part of that number. So yeah. for example, I'm a perfectionist um, who is very driven and motivated by a desire to help that can lend itself to being controlling. So I'm much better now at being able to recognize when I am trying to be controlling, fully self-correct. Um, so it doesn't change my instincts, but it just really helps me to recognize it and to go, okay, this, this instinct that I have, which is natural for me, it always has been, isn't gonna be helpful to all of this because my kids need to be empowered right now. And that's where like really, <laughs> you know, like one of the things when you have a kid who has all these public behaviors and stuff, you um you have to get really comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and I spent I spent way too much time apologizing to people, um, excusing and even I mean, even saying, you know, like even telling people he's in foster care, like wanting to make sure they knew yeah. I'm actually the hero here. Mm -hmm. I'm not the bad mom. I'm the hero. Yeah. You know, and that's I'm ashamed of that now. I'm telling you that um because I realized like because of my own ego and my own pride, I didn't want strangers thinking I was just a bad mom. And that's why my kid was behaving the way he was. Mm -hmm. So I would tell them he's my foster son. And then it was like, Oh, you're so you know, and, and I felt better, right. And I realized that totally didn't do us anything to help him. I mean, that was all about me. And so really, um, beginning to understand myself for better, and for worse, mm -hmm. has been a gift to in a lot of ways, my kids too, because I'm much more able to like, let my child, I have one child right now who loves putting together her outfits. And I want so much to fix her hair for her because it just, I, it would look so cute if she yeah. just let me do that. But no, she wants to do her hair herself. And I'm like, you know what? 
good. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's interesting that, so I'm a seven, but when my worst site on the triangle, I revert to a one. So yeah. I really get what you're I'm saying. Your <laughs> <side. laughs> one negative tendencies because I have been there. <clears throat> it's interesting because I'm still fairly new to the Enneagram. I haven't read a ton of the books yet. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard that one that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. That one's been recommended several times. So that is on my list for the summer. Yeah. But um, have you listened to Sleeping at Last? He has created a song for mm -hmm. every number. No. Oh, you have to go. When we're done here, you have to go check him out. You can do it. Yeah. Just do Sleeping at Last Enneagram one and the video will come up. I love it. I okay. was crying through mine. So. Oh, I love it. <laughs> um, I think as a seven, though, I just want to let you know quickly, <laughs> it's probably the worst number to be to be a foster parent because you're it's an enthusiast and you're always looking for the next thing. <laughs> and it's just like, how, OK, well, I got to do this next and this next. And the, but yeah. you know, foster care keeps you. And yeah. for a situation, you know, we're almost two years into an adoption that was supposed to happen a year ago. So wow. <laughs> it's like God is like, OK, don't go to those worst. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. There's a podcast too. So since you recommend that, there's a podcast that I recommend called Typology and it's hosted by one of the um, co-authors of The Road Back to You. And it's definitely a great podcast to listen to. And I think it would be, um, you know, it would probably be very insightful. Awesome. Well. I will check that out. I'm but, still yeah. learning a lot, but it's interesting because um, I've been doing this Kind of leadership program at my church and doing spiritual giftings and just learning doing all sorts of behavior analysis and learning about mm -hmm. analysis and <laughs> learning about myself and it's mm -hmm. it's been really interesting and i think i for a long time i didn't really put too much stock in that like because then i thought you know then you start behaving because you are supposed to be this way or right but the enneagram out of all of them yes you no know, it just it everything about it makes sense yeah, like that's yeah. me that's me that's <laughs> me so i think it's just interesting i think this next cuz it's really i mean i know it's been around for years and years and years but it's really truly been the past couple of years that it's gotten really yeah. popular no it's definitely been i mean it's been around but it has not been a popular thing in the west for sure yeah. and um and i do think that yeah, in the last probably five to 10 years, it's really is when it, it's gotten a popular, you know, awareness. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's it, this in this book, The Road Back to You, it says uh, a one with a two wing is someone who talks too much and tries to do too many things in one day. Or maybe he says talks a lot <laughs> and tries to accomplish too many things in one day. And I was like, oh my gosh, That's he knows me. He knows me. And I can't help that I'm this way. Yeah. I felt so liberated by it. I, right. It gives you some but validation. Like, like, okay, it's okay that I do this. I'm supposed yes. to get this way. I'm in, I mean, really, like, I'm in seminary right now. I started seminary in, um, in well, this, I'm in my second class right now. Because, I mean, I'm not getting any younger, right? Yeah. And, like, I've got dreams and I've got things to do. And, you know, and, um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm a worship leader at my church. And I'm the PTA president next year. And, you know, we have four children and, you know, and they're all in sports. And I mean, it's just like, I pack it in, pack yeah. it in, pack yeah. it in. And I wouldn't want it any other way. There are people who look at my life and they're like, I'm exhausted just listening to you. And I'm like, no, this makes me feel so alive, you know? <laughs> and then you <laughs> explains why. <laughs> Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. I'm going to end it here because I think okay. uh, it's getting pretty long, but I would love to do another collaboration in the future. I think this has been time. I have just loved talking to you so much. I knew I would. I'm so glad. <laughs> you this out. So thank you guys so much for watching today. Definitely go check out Christy's channel. I will leave it linked down below in the description box. Um, but thanks for being here. If you're interested in foster care, you have any questions, either of us would love to talk to you, I'm sure. So definitely connect with her, connect with me as well. Um, and I'll see you guys on the next video. Bye.